Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's Casual Friday podcast, I have tidbits. I have two new developments in my 1960s vintage sweater project, and I am announcing a collaboration for my 1940s vintage project, which will be uh, coming up next. So let's get started. This first tidbit is that the Italian Museum of Los Angeles seeks needlework with a story behind it or about it, made by Italians or Italian Americans for an upcoming exhibition. So they're interested in all kinds of needlework, including knitting and crochet, but also sewing and embroidery. So if you or someone you know might be interested in participating in this, I will leave links to everything I talk about in the tidbits down in the show notes. This tidbit showed up in my Twitter feed. I'm pretty sure somebody retweeted it. And while I agree with the sentiment, I wasn't really completely sure why the National Archives of the United Kingdom was tweeting this image out and making this statement about it. But then I started reading the comments to that post and I started seeing a lot of other archives and archivists responding to their tweet and agreeing that in fact the cardigan specifically was probably the most important thing in the world as well because because you can't be an archivist if you're not wearing a cardigan is what they were implying. So I'm not only happy that the National Archives tweeted out this particular image, which I think is really cool, but I also love that they shared their sentiment that knitwear is the most important thing. This tidbit showed up in my Twitter feed as well, and it's a, I'll leave the link to the blog post that this is about, and it's about the history of weaving in Scotland. The blog post was written by a woman named Peggy McKillop and what she says is that when she grew up she always thought that weaving was something that men did. That all of the crofters that she knew, these men, had a loom in their shed and you could uh, hear them, you could hear the looms running in the evenings when it was quiet. And so in her mind that was something uh, that men did. But then she started to realize that that, that wasn't actually true. And I will say that I did have that impression historically that, that that weaving was something that men did where women were doing the spinning and that men were doing the weaving. Now I, I know that that wasn't true necessarily in the United States as people immigrated here and people were doing weaving in their own homes. That wouldn't necessarily be true but I had did have that impression that that was true in the UK. And one of the things that gave me that impression was the the vintage knitting kits from the 60s and 70s that I bought back in February and which I'm using um, for my 1960s vintage sweater. One of the kits that I bought was an incomplete kit. It was this one here. It was an Andrew Stewart kit. It did not have all of the yarn that was originally in the kit and it didn't include a pattern that was missing. So my feeling was that the knitter had started the sweater, used the pattern and three, three of the balls of yarn and then got sick of it and then put it to the side. And what remained was uh, the, the rest of the yarn. But also these kits included uh, a skirt length of coordinating fabric. And this fabric was hand woven Scottish tweed. And this particular kit that I had that's missing some yarn and a pattern included this particular photograph right here of the weaver who made this fabric. And his name was Andrew Mowat or Mowat. He's a fisherman crofter hand weaving on one of the Andrew Stewart looms in Shetland. So this is advertised as genuine crofter woven Shetland tweed. Again, that was my impression that it was mainly a male occupation in the UK and particularly in Scotland. But Peggy, who wrote this blog post, realized that when she started doing some research and she was looking at old census records from the 19th century, she was looking in this one small community and there was a man who was li listed 
I believe as a weaver. There were a lot of girls and women who were listed as weaveresses or as apprentices. So only one man was listed as a weaver in that community. And then everyone else who was learning to weave or was occupied as a weaver were women. And so she began being really fascinated by uh, the history of weaving and women weavers in particular. So this blog post includes a short video. It's about a minute and a half. It's a little video of a woman who lives on the Isle of Harris, I believe. So she weaves Harris Tweed, a, a certified Harris Tweed. She'll make her own tweed weaving designs as well. Her loom is more automated that she has. So I'd never seen one like that that was like privately owned. I've seen the great big manufacturing looms that are just enormous. You can find the link down in the show notes. This one is about the first modern ladies magazine, which was published between 1770 and 1819. And I have a link to this project that this woman named Jenny Batchelor is has been doing. She had been researching these lady, ladies magazines and she loved reading the articles. But one of the things that she noticed was that there were articles and other bits of discussion about embroidery pat patterns that had been included in the magazine. And none of the magazines that she was finding that was, that was uh, talking about them still had those embroidery patterns in there because they were meant to be torn out and used while somebody was, was uh, embroidering that particular design. And eventually she came across one magazine that did have six of the patterns in them. And she just began this quest to keep collecting as many of these embroidery patterns from this uh, ladies magazine as she could. So there's a website where you can go and look at, I think there's, it, it, when I looked this morning, there were 52 and I assume over time it will grow as they discover more. There are 52 of these patterns that were originally in the magazines. I looked to see if they had any images of, of embroidery that had been done using that pattern, like they could verify, oh, we've seen this embroidery pattern here, or if anybody uh, currently had embroidered a pattern from one of those designs, because they were, they're encouraging people to do that and then share their results. So the one that I'm showing you on the screen is a map of Europe. And the idea was that it could teach the children the geography of Europe in a way that would be less boring to them or that they might retain the information more. Uh, and I thought that was so cool that that would be a way that you could intimately really understand where, what the countries were and where the borders were and how they were shaped and where they were relative to another country because you would be spending so much time making those border placements in your sampler. I will leave a link down there in the show notes to, so where, where you can see those images of these original patterns that were in the ladies magazine. This tidbit showed up in my email box because I am a member of the Knitting History Forum and I, which I joined uh, last year when I, when they had a conference that was done by Zoom and I really found it interesting and I joined the organization and then I have access to you know various materials and I get notified of when they're having a, a, events. So in normal times, this would be a conference that would they would do in person and there would probably be 20, 25 people in attendance. Um, but when they can do it worldwide, I believe last year there was something like 300 people from all over the world who are attending, that, attending it. And it's free again this year. You can make a PayPal donation if you want to, um, but it's not required. And you register through Eventbrite. The dates are, uh, it's the 13th of November and it starts at 10 a.m. UK time, which for me here in the US, I live in central time and it'll be 4 a.m. And I remember last year I did wake myself up early. I set an alarm. I often wake up very early in the morning, but I was afraid of oversleeping. Um, so the times may not work for you. I don't recall if if they record these and make them available later, it's possible they will, but I, I can't guarantee that. So if the times don't work with you, sorry about that. There's nothing I can do. The way that this conference works is that various people, many of them are 
people in their 20s who are working on their PhDs and they're sharing some of the research that they are doing for their PhD. But there are also people who are independent researchers who are really passionate about a specific time and place or item in knitting history and they visit museums and they do all kinds of research and then they share what they have learned. So I really enjoyed it last year and which is why I joined the Knitting History Forum and that's how I ended up getting this email that about notifying me about what the dates were going to be this year. If you are interested you can register through the link that I will leave down in the show notes. This last tidbit came to me from Quiltaroo on Ravelry, who sent me a link to another Raveler's project that was related to a hand spinning breed study. I thought this was a really interesting, very different approach to doing a breed study than what I'm doing. First of all, this other person is much more experienced a spinner than I am. The way that they do their breed study is they buy a raw fleece of some wool breed where they go to a fiber festival and they encounter this raw fleece and they buy it and then they process it and they spin it and then they design a square to knit that is related to the history of that wool breed. And what she does is if she has a couple of different stories that she has heard about the history of this particular breed, and one of them is just basic facts that aren't super interesting, but are probably true, she might put that one to the side and instead use the story that's a little bit more uh, fictionalized, uh, fant uh, fantastical, probably not true, but gets her creative juices going more so that she can figure out something interesting to knit that would be related to that story. Just something that connects her knitting with that breed of sheep. She had done this over several years. She had accumulated fleeces and she'd spun them and she'd knit them into these really cool squares and she made a vest, which was sleeveless. And a vest in the US, uh, V-neck, sleeveless pullover or whatever you would call it in the UK. Eventually had enough additional squares to add sleeves and now she has a jacket. So I'm gonna leave a link to that, her project page, because it's really cool. It's such a cool idea and it's completely different from what I'm doing, which is I bought a sampler kit of 30 wool breeds that were one ounce a piece. They were all processed and ready to spin right out of the box. Very different approach. Um, to what she's doing. Neither one is right. It just goes to show you that spinners are as different as knitters are when it comes to why they enjoy this particular craft, what their goals are, what they're looking for, what path they happen to wander down when they get sucked into a breed study. I had seen this project a couple of years ago, but I'd totally forgotten about it. And so I was re I'm really happy that Quilteru sent me that, that link because I think it's really, really cool. My hope for this week was that I would have all of the seaming for my 1960s sweater complete. I'd have all the ends woven in and potentially I could have had the button bands, the stabilizing grosgrain ribbon uh, sewn in. That was my original plan. There have been two developments in this project, one which is a bit of a disaster, and the other was just information that was new to, to me that I wanted to explore. So let's talk about, let's do the bad news first, and then we'll do the interesting good news, what I consider the good news. When I was sewing in the first sleeve into my 1960s sweater, it, I could tell it wasn't gonna fit. It didn't, wasn't really fitting the hole properly. I'm gonna be, let me see if I can hold this up so you can see. You see how it's kind of gathered right there? It's puckered. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be a smooth sleeve cap. So that was an issue. And originally I thought it might have been an issue with the way that I was seaming it in. And so I took the seam out and I tried a slightly different thing. And so the, the seam is better, but it didn't eliminate the puckering. And I thought, is it a design issue? Was there a problem with the way the cap was designed to go inside the armhole? Because you can look at the photo of the sweater and it doesn't look like that. So uh, was there a design issue or do I have a gauge issue or 
Is it a combination of the two things? So I was thinking back on when I started this sweater and the gauge that I was getting, which was early March. Then I started thinking about when I was knitting these sleeves. And I was thinking at the time that I was knitting them, gee, the gauge looks a little looser. And I kept measuring in the car and, and I couldn't quite tell. And, I, and by the time we got back from our road trip, I just told myself it was close enough. It was maybe slightly a little bit looser, maybe from knitting in the car. And I knit the entire 1950s sweater this summer. I just finished it and then I came back to the 1960s sweater. So I started thinking about this and what I realized was I have noticed the past few years that in, in the summertime, my hands swell up. When I'm knitting at these fine gauges on tiny needles, that does seem to affect the size needles I need. Like my hands are swollen so they don't hold the needles quite the same way that they would when my hands are not swollen. And because I knit the sleeves of my 1960s sweater in the summer when we were on a road trip and it was over 100 degrees outside, it was like 40 degrees Celsius outside, so hot. I was very hot, my hands were, were were swollen. So I went and I like really measured carefully the gauge that I was getting on my sleeve and then I measured the gauge on the back of the sweater which is the piece I started on when I started the sweater in early March when my hands were not swollen and there was a significant difference in gauge. So I am certain that there is a problem with gauge. That is the very bad news. The interesting news is that I've been talking in the past few weeks about how I like to stabilize the button bands of cardigans and the buttonhole bands with grow grain ribbon. I've done that on every one of the vintage sweaters in this long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade. Uh, for the sweaters that have been cardigans, which is most of them, there have been two pullovers. Two pullovers? Yeah, two pullovers. Uh, the others have been cardigans and those I, uh, I used grow grain ribbon and I've also used grow grain ribbon to stabilize the front bands of sweaters that didn't have buttons and buttonholes but they did open up and I did stabilize those sweaters as well with grow grain ribbon and my plan was in this week that I would I would uh, do that for the button bands but I got three comments in last week's video when I was talking about grow grain ribbon nobody has made this comment in previous videos in the previous few weeks when I've talked about the grow grain ribbon, but three people mentioned Petersham ribbon as an alternative to grow grain ribbon. It might be a coincidence, but I think there may have been, a, I think one of the people mentioned that there was a post on Facebook about using Petersham ribbon instead of grow grain ribbon. And may, it's possible that all three of the people had happened to see this, or maybe it's just the universe throwing a coincidence my way. So I'd heard of Petersham fabric before and in the context of historical sewing, but I have never seen it before. So I didn't really know what it was. People were commenting, oh, it's supposed to be better. Or I was reminded that it was better. And I said, well, what, what is it that's better about it? And so some of the qualities were mentioned in, in responses. But in the meantime, I was uh, on uh, Google <laughs> looking things up. And uh, what I found is that it, it's a type of ribbon that looks very, very similar to grow grain ribbon and has a few different qualities that make it very beneficial when you are sewing with woven fabrics. So my question was, do those advantages have any meaning when used as a stabilizer for a hand knit sweater button band? Just because it's better than grow grain in a sewing situation with woven fabrics, that may not be an advantage or disadvantage when it comes to hand knit fabrics. So I found a source online. I did a bunch of searching and so that I could find a source that sold um, Petersham ribbon in a wide rate, I think 11 different widths they sell it and they have 80 colors and you can buy it by the yard, where when I uh, buy grow grain ribbon at like Joann's, which is a big box store here in the US, I have to get a whole spool of it. And it, this is, I think it's, it says 21 feet, which is seven yards, almost seven meters. I have to buy that much ribbon 
just to stabilize the two fronts of a cardigan. So I, it's not expensive, but it's, it's more than I need and it accumulates here in my sewing room. I would rather just buy what I need um, or a little bit more than I need rather than you know seven times what I need. So I ordered a couple of colors. I ordered two colors, two widths, and they just came yesterday. So I wanna go to the overhead and I wanna show you what they look like visually, what the difference is, and then I'm gonna tell you my experiment. So this is the Grosgrain ribbon. This is the spool of ribbon that I bought in order to create the band, the, to stabilize the button band of my 1960s sweater. And this is, of course, it's a different color, but this is the ribbon that I bought that is Petersham. So let's take a really close look. So I am zoomed in as close as I can. So this is the Grosgrain ribbon. This is made from polyester. That's typically what Grosgrain is made from. Historically, it could have been made from, you know, natural fibers of some sort. But what you'll see is this edge is very straight. It's almost like it's it's sealed. If, if I run my fingernail um, this way, I can feel like a little ridge there. So if I were to, to bring a needle up, I'd probably want to bring it up in the fabric um, inside uh, the boundaries of that particular edge. So this is a very straight edge and it has a ridge. These ridges are because when this fabric is woven, the warp strands that go perpendicularly that are hooked up into the loom are of a thinner yarn or thread than the weft yarns. And so it creates this corded look because the weft strands are so much thicker. So let's look at the Petersham. And what you see is you can actually see the way that the weft threads curve around when it when they get woven it comes around and it goes back and forth so it has kind of a little bit of a, a scalloped edge to it so the other difference between these two is that this is rayon and that seems to be pretty typical these days for petersham ribbon so this is rayon and this is polyester so polyester is a synthetic fabric Rayon is what's called a semi-synthetic fabric. Rayon is really one of the first, it is the first synth synthetic uh, fiber that was invented. And it starts with a natural fiber like wood pulp or some kind of plant fiber, which is dissolved in chemicals. It's really, really processed. And then it's turned into these fibers that, that are called rayon, also called artificial silk. So this has more drape to it. So if, I, if I'm holding these the same distance away from the edge, let's see if I get this far away. So if I hold them, you can see that the rayon is drooping down and the, the polyester is a little bit stiffer. Now, that doesn't mean that this one is better than that one because this one has more drape. It also doesn't mean it's worse than that one because it has more drape. Because again, the purpose that I'm using this ribbon for is to stabilize a sweater button band. Now, I like the way this feels in my hand better than I like the polyester. So that's a tactile preference that as the, the knitter who is, or the maker who is, who is using this, I prefer this in my hands in the same way that I like the way merino wool feels in my hands, but I don't necessarily like knitting sweaters with merino wool because it tends to pill and, uh, and it isn't as strong as other wool. So just because I like the way it feels, again, doesn't mean that it's better. So one of the things that I have to do with this ribbon when I'm using it to stabilize the bands is to create buttonholes. One of the changes I made in my last sweater where I used Grosgrain ribbon was I used a tearaway stabilizer when I was sewing the buttonholes in there. And that really created a much more stable buttonhole. I was thrilled with that. So I know that I can get a much better buttonhole now than I used to when I'm using this, that tearaway stabilizer. Well, I would use that with this as well. So I am going to compare when I sew buttonholes in these two ribbons, is there a difference or do a, is one better than the other? And then the other thing I'm gonna look at is what is it like to actually sew with these things? Do I notice a difference in how easy or difficult it is to sew this into the knitted fabric? And then I will compare 
what I think of the stabilized edge with the grosgrain ribbon over here versus the Petersham ribbon. Again, this is considered superior to grosgrain in when sewing woven fabrics. And the reason it's superior is because it can be uh, formed into a curve. These scallops right here allow that edge to be to be bent. And when you use a steam iron on it, you can uh, create a curve to this uh, ribbon edge, which is really good if you're putting it in as a facing in like a waistband or if you're putting it around the brim of a hat. So it has to be a curve like that. Petersham is really good uh, for that and you can't shape the polyester that way. It doesn't need to curve when it's used in a button band. So the things that I need to test are how easy is, is it to sew with? How well does it stabilize? the button band and how nice are the buttonholes uh, when they are sewn into them. So those are the things that I will be comparing in the coming week or two. While I am toiling away trying to get this 1960s vintage sweater project completed, I am thinking ahead to what my next project will be. As most of you probably know, I have been working on this long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. And this 1960s sweater will mean that I have done everything from the 1890s up to the 1960s, with one exception. And one of my viewers noticed that exception was the 1940s, which is a personal favorite decade of hers. And she su suggested a collaboration. And so that is what I'll be talking about next in a conversation with Billy Elias, known on Ravelry and Instagram as Billy Toy. I'll leave her information down below. We actually did this conversation in two parts. And one part is on her channel, which is called Show and Tell Knitting. And I will leave links to that conversation down below as well. It's a much more extensive conversation than what you are going to see here today on mine. So if you are interested in that, you will be able to see the two of us talking <laughs> at length about this, uh, this uh, collaboration. Um, but in the meantime, uh, let me introduce you to Billy. Uh, just as an introduction to you, when did you learn to knit? I was four years old. And the reason I can remember that, in my life, there's a line of demarcation. My parents were married, and then they were no longer married. They got divorced when I was about four and a half or five. So for me, anything that happened in the house where we lived together as a family, I know was before I was four and a half. I was four when my mother, I still have the knitting needles and I have shown them on my show. They're about this long, they're blue plastic size six needles, which seem to be just the right size for worsted yarn. My mother taught me, but she she wasn't really a knitter. I didn't see her knitting scarves or knitting booties or sweaters or anything. She just knew how to knit. She knew how to do everything. My mother was totally incredible. So I was four, in short, to answer your question. Okay. I knit then, little squares. That's all I knit. She gave me scrap yarn and I knit little squares. So she was well, she must have knit enough to have scrap yarn. You know, I was thinking about that the other day. Where did this yarn come from? she must have asked somebody who she knew for mm -hmm. their discards because she wasn't doing anything with these yarns. There were too many colors and they weren't all exactly the same weight, which is why my little squares, when I put them together as a teenager to make them into an Afghan, it was hideous because they, they weren't yeah. uniform. But you had this interest in vintage clothing and I think jewelry too, don't you? Is that true? Big time. So how did, when did that start? When did you get this interest in vintage clothing? Hmm. I think it was probably in the 80s when I came to know someone through business who was the president of the Art Deco Society of New York. I loved how she dressed. She was always, and she's still always, so many years later, always in period clothes. Now I've been to her home, her entire house. There's nothing modern in it. 
So she was kind of like my muse. I always liked vintage fashion because it's so different. Mm -hmm. I've always been sort of like the um, the outsider, nonconformist, not in a really radical way, but if everybody was wearing a fad, I probably didn't want that. Like I wouldn't want a Chanel handbag because other people have a Chanel handbag. Anything with a label on it was like not appealing to me. So vintage, you're getting something that's really well-made, really interesting style. There's some history, like someone else wore this. I have quite a few things that belong to other people. And I wonder like, well, where did they go wearing this fur tippet with the little fox head on it? Like what luncheon were they going to? So I've been fascinated by it probably since mid eighties. I had a costume jewelry business for years before I was married. That was already my second career. I had been an engineer in a previous life. I was importing costume jewelry. So I became very interested in jewelry per se. And more and more, I gravitated to vintage because I love things like this. They're so different, so unique. And then how did you merge those two interests? When did you start knitting from vintage patterns? I was already beginning to collect vintage clothing and finding it hard to get things in my size because I don't have a 26 or a 28 inch waist, which a lot of vintage clothes have. When I resumed knitting after a long hiatus, I thought to myself, well, I'm knitting sweaters mostly. Why not knit vintage sweaters? Then I can have extend my vintage wardrobe with things that actually are made to fit me. So when was that like the past? 10, just the past several years. Oh, okay. So just yeah, recently. recent. Okay. So Billy noticed when I recently finished my 1950s sweater that I had knit in my long-term project from the 1890s up to the 1960s, but I there was a little hole in there where there was no 1940s sweater. And this is a really strong interest of hers. So she uh, messaged me and we have a history of uh, <laughs> communicating with each other on Ravelry and also Instagram. So I have seen some of the things that she has knit from the 1940s and that she's working on and that are um, great. And so when she, she suggested that maybe we collaborate on a sweater for the 1940s, that could be really interesting. Why don't you explain your process for sort of inspiration and how you accumulate ideas for things that you might want to knit in the future? Largely due to the pandemic, I've watched a lot of movies, vintage films, generally black and white, like Fred Astaire, you know, they always have these amazing art deco costumes, these films that were made in the 30s and the 40s. So if I'm watching something on my computer and I see somebody wearing something, it doesn't have to be a sweater, but if they're wearing something that maybe has an illusion neckline, I'll just take a screenshot and I have a folder on my computer where I keep these little inspirations, thinking someday I might want to try and incorporate a feature, an element into a sweater. In fact, I did a sweater like that from a photograph of a socialite. She is, I think, the great aunt of Gloria Vanderbilt. She was wearing a what I believe was probably an evening gown. I only saw the upper part of it, and I designed my first sweater ever with this same kind of look. So it could be from photographs. It could be things I've seen online. I've been taking an opera class five days a week and watching a lot of opera during the pandemic. And the people in the operas do like amazing costumes. So often there are operas that are set in historic period clothes. So I'll just take a screenshot and I put these things in my folder. Sometimes it could be the inspiration for not only the shape, but color combinations. And in my backyard, I have the Metropolitan Museum, which is also a great resource for vintage and looking at colors from the period. So to me, it sounds like you are looking at, oh, I really like that style, or I really like that des design or those colors. And you are trying to find a way to bring that into something that 
that is from the era that you want to replicate in a sweater. So you might design something yourself that's inspired by that. Not often. Do you take uh, an existing, say, 1940s pattern, typically, or 1930s, and then say, oh, th this is what I want to apply to that silhouette? Or 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 do you are you more often saying, oh, that's a really neat sweater. I'm going to knit that. It's probably a combination of those. The sweater that I'm wearing, for instance, it's a pattern that I saw in Ravelry and I saw a woman wearing her version of it. She had modified the pattern and I liked very much what she did. A lot of vintage patterns have very deep ribbing. This pattern had shorter ribbing and more of the pattern but I liked how hers looked. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna like borrow that concept. I'm gonna make deeper ribbing and I'm gonna make the ribbing hit me where I want it to hit me, even though that wasn't exactly what the pattern called for. So I stayed somewhat true to the pattern. That was a vintage pattern that you changed yes. or was it a contemporary pattern that you made look vintage? This was a vintage pattern. It's 1940 something. Billy's proud and because she's so interested in fashion, she really looks outside, like she's looking around the real world. <laughs> I'm more interested in the search for a different construction, how techniques were used. I, and I'm looking at this in the context of a century of knitting patterns and how it's evolved and putting this sweater in the context of all the other ones. So we're, we're coming at this in very, uh, very different ways, but we still have this common goal of a 19... 40 sweater but we have I mean we definitely have an overlapping thing yeah. because for me it it isn't just about the fashion it is also about the stitch the yeah. construction I mean I hadn't done this stitch before um but it's that that what I'm always harping on on my channel about there are multiple ways of getting to the same end point we may both really like this end point but we may be coming at it from different perspectives or different approaches that there is a lot of overlap, but it's just a different uh, mindset. So to me, an idea of collaborating with somebody who is very, you know, much more in tune with and knowledgeable about the fashion of the era uh, was really appealing. And I felt like maybe I could make a decision because I was feeling overwhelmed by my choices. We started emailing each other and she's sending me picture after picture. And I'm like, okay, there's all these things that I like. How am I going to remember this in this email? Like, this is not a good way for me to track the information. Any of you who have seen more than one of my videos will know that I love spreadsheets. So what I thought was, oh, this will be a really good way to have a big picture view of all of our choices by having a little thumbnail of each of the patterns. And then I made columns that talked about the different uh, aspects of each of these particular sweaters. And then Billy suggested we have columns for comments. I don't know how many sweaters, there were 10 or 15 sweaters and they're all together. For me, it was a really good way to see, oh, consistently I'm really drawn to this, this, and this. And Billy is also drawn to this, this, and this. Here's where we're differing, where she basically has no comment. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm really loving that one. Once we started building that spreadsheet and once we had populated it with about 15 or 16 different things, it was pretty clear what appealed to, uh, to both of us. And the surprise was that it wasn't one pattern. <laughs> it was two patterns. And so one of my goals with the 1940s was to use, to either use that make do and mend mentality of reusing yarn or using a limited amount of yarn that I might have in, in conjunction with something else or um, something like that, or to use uh, something that I've seen repeatedly in knitting manuals from those 30s and 40s, which is really teaching the knitter how to make modifications to a particular pattern. Because in those days, they typically came in one size and it was up to the knitter to know how to size it. But by the 1930s, they actually were going out of their way to teach knitters how to do that. <laughs> 
we actually ended up with two sweaters that we are going to combine um, together. And I'll put the pictures of those uh, up here. And again, you can see more of that discussion on um, Billy's channel. The big question is, how are we going to prepare for this? Because we are going to be merging kind of two different patterns. So we're, how are we going to prepare for this? And then kind of what our timeline is. We have, I think, agreed on early November, right? There's going to have to be some modifications because the two, the two patterns are originally designed with different yarn weights and a kind of some different structural issues or uh, structural uh, elements. I think over the coming weeks, we'll, we'll probably be sharing how we are each individually preparing to knit this, like what our processes are. Because again, even though we have a lot of overlap in how we do things, we're not exactly the same. And, and we're probably going to have to modify them for different sizes and, and for different body shapes, like Billy has shared that she's a little more short waisted, I'm, I'm more long waisted. So, you know, figuring out how those are going to, to fit our bodies and how we want them to fit. And it will also be interesting to see which elements from each sweater we might choose to incorporate because we may end up not doing exactly the same thing, right? I think we're probably gonna have different necklines. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about my neckline. And one of the things that, that I really wanted in the 1940s was the, the shoulders. Collar. Oh, shoulders, yeah. But I, well, I wanted a collar and neither one of the two sweaters has a collar. Well, you and know, so I've been thinking you about- You could do a collar that had- The like two colors. The colors and, I, and the I, shape. And yes, exactly. That was my idea was- Well, I'm leaving that to you because that's- <laughs> For sure, this woman is a master knitter and I am rookie. <laughs> You're not a rookie, you've been knitting for way longer than I have. But well, yes, I'm primarily a sweater knitter. So, hey, listen, for newbies out there, it's a process. You're not born into getting a good fitting garment. I struggled with it a lot. I don't have a mannequin and there are some tricks, probably Roxanne has talked about some of these things on her show, but I have found with each sweater that I knit, I'm tweaking a little bit more, a little bit more. I'm really happy with how this fits. I think it fits well in the shoulder. I have narrow shoulders. I think I nailed it. I got the pattern to kind of work okay. It's not voluminous in here but I could also show you this beautiful gray sweater that I knit that has ruffles in fabric. It's exquisite. It's from Vogue Knitting. That the first time I knit it, the sleeves were like somebody else could put their arm in there with me. And it's a really ugly look. So you get better and better once you start to know your body type and know where you need to rein things in, like, I can't wear a shoulder that's 15 inch because I'm more like 14 from shoulder to shoulder. So I'll make an adjustment there. And it's, it's a process. Sometimes you have to rip well, it out. And also like I am, you very much understand color and fashion. And I think of myself as like a knitting architect. Like I can solve an engineering problem. That doesn't mean that that my solution is going to be beautiful. Like, and so I might realize that once I see it go, oh, that didn't work. You know, I can think of a, a bunch of different things I could do and whether or not that would reflect 1940s. Right. Not, is another question. But I think it's going to be an interesting journey. And I'm excited about this one in particular, just because, well, it's the collaboration process, but also the idea of um, still keeping 1940s, but using using techniques that they would have used at the time, which is modifying and combining things and understanding um, uh, how, how you want to shape something. So there might even be a third sweater in there at some point just for the silhouette that I'm looking for, because these two sweaters are very different. Like you were pointing out on your video that um, the one that has the triangles has, uh, is I think longer in the body and hemmed. Mm -hmm. And the one that's from uh, the, a Trove, the Australian newspaper database is um, 
I think ribbed at the bottom. This might end up being something that that uh, looks like 1940s, but isn't knit directly from a 1940s pattern, but uses the influences of, of several patterns. We each have some projects we need to finish up before we get started. And then our hope, like Billy likes to work straight through until she gets done with something these days. And anybody who has watched my channel will know. <laughs> The reason that my 1960s sweater is not done yet is because I keep putting it to the side. It's a change of habit for me. I had too many UFOs and it was unwieldy and unpleasant. And you feel so guilty if you have like eight, 10 things that could be wearable and beautiful that, you know, you simply have to put them together. Come on. Or you have to sew on the buttons. So yeah, that was like a bad habit. And I wanted to break myself of that and really try and finish up. The pandemic has been a perfect opportunity to do that. You know, I don't have the usual daily life responsibilities. I'm hanging out a lot of the time. So there's yeah. time. I, I pulled out a lot of those things and I worked through and now I have like such peace of mind. I'm working on one thing. I think this also shows though that the, again, there are multiple ways of getting rid of U UFOs. Like I realized a few years ago, I also feel kind of a little sick to my stomach if I have too many extra things. I just, oh, and I recognize that I only have a tolerance of working on something for a specific amount of time before I need a break from it. So I, I started doing finish it February. Well, I had one year where I finished as many projects as I could. Then I started doing finish it February. So for me, I keep putting things, if I put something to the side and I don't finish it, I know that February is coming up and that I will do it then. So I have way fewer unfinished things nowadays. Me too. Than I used to, and I am much happier about it. Yeah. So it, it, but it doesn't mean that everybody has to finish everything. <laughs> it just means that the two of us both had that same kind of feeling about our UF, about our UFOs, and we each came up with a way to deal with it. So it'll be interesting to see how we deal with this particular project. And it could be that we'll, we'll get a little competitive. How far are you? How far are you? <laughs> <laughs> you race to are you competitive? I think it depends on, on the situation. I don't, yeah, it depends. Like not, not typically most of the time I'm like, oh, you do you, I'll do me. I don't care. But uh, this could be something where I wouldn't want to get behind. I think that's <laughs> the reason that I want to be ahead is that I don't want to get behind. That's probably more what it is. Well, we haven't talked about how to structure that. If yeah, that's well, going to be an issue. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I we think can... it's going to be an issue. We'll just figure it out when it happens. That's usually what I do is like- You can put milestones. Well, you know, a lot of times if I, I, I as my mother used to say, uh, Roxanne, you can plan, but you can't plan the outcome. So I can have my ideas about what it is I think I'm going to do. And then as I get into it, I'm like, oh, I don't like this plan. I'm going to do something else. I use my plans as a way to point me in a direction. Billy, I thank you very much. And again, we have a separate discussion that's about this um, collaboration that goes into way more detail, I believe, that will be on Billy's channel. And so I will leave a link down to that video as well down in the show notes so that if you want to see the other side of this conversation, you can do that. And the spreadsheet. It's very and the cool. spreadsheet. Yeah, she shows the Roxanne spreadsheet. spreadsheet. Thank you so much, Billy. Thank you, you, Roxanne. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.